Okay, so we're at we're at seven o'clock. Um, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, regardless of where you are are currently situated watching uh, this webinar. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful to have each of you with us tonight. Um, my name is Silva. I work with the Institute of Holistic Nutrition in the communications department and as a program advisor. Um, it's great to uh, it's great to be um, having this webinar tonight. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, Dr. David, and then I'll let him take the uh, take the floor. Um, Dr. David is a naturopathic doctor with a special interest in a holistic approach to cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and autoimmune disease. His clinical focus is to address the cause of disease and support the body's ability to heal naturally. Through advanced laboratory testing and the use of nutrition, lifestyle modification, herbal medicine, orthomolecular medicine, intravenous therapy, and physical medicine, he aims to reduce symptoms and reverse disease processes. Dr. David earned his Bachelor of Science at the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario in 2008, and his Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine in, at the Boucher Institute in 2014, where he currently sits as the Director on the Board of Governors. Um, Dr. David, it's great to have you tonight, and we look forward to your webinar. Oh, and just briefly, I wanted to say that um, we will be monitoring the Q&A and we'll be doing the Q&A afterwards. So um, if you have questions, you can certainly put them in the chat um, and the Q&A and we'll get to all those um, at the end. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. Okay, let's do it. Thanks for the kind introduction there. I'll jump right into my slides. I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me for just a second as I share. Let's do it. Okay, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm so uh, proud to be able to give these type of sessions. Thanks for having me to IHN. I really appreciate it. Tonight, I'm talking about metabolism assessment and optimization for weight loss in a clinical nutrition practice. As a naturopathic doctor, of course, I do a lot of nutrition, but I also uh, teach at IHN. And, um, and uh, I'm really passionate about supporting those uh, who are working in complementary and alternative care uh, to improve their to improve their ability to support patients uh, to lead healthier lives. So I, I really, I really like this type of presentation because it's, it's foundational. I think so many uh, of us here in, in North America are, are dealing with difficulties, maintaining a healthy weight and uh, it, it data driven approaches to weight loss uh, make the actual process so much easier in my experience. And uh, I really feel like this session that you're, that we're, I'm, I'm giving tonight is like foundational. I, I come back to all of this information literally every single day in my practice, and I hope you do too. Okay, let's get into it. Um, so uh, I'd like to give a little shout out first before we begin. Uh, I teach a continuing education course at IHN called Laboratory Diagnostics and Clinical Practice. I love teaching this course. I think it's really, really important for holistic nutritionists to take this course to take this course, excuse me. Uh, this is a seven week continuing education. Uh, we do it so like three hours per week. Uh, in a session that is, um, that is uh, all, it's all about lab work. It's all about how to not necessarily review and diagnose labs, but how to um, support patients to understand what their lab work actually means. And so in this, this session that we do, we, we do, um, we look at uh, the pathology around disease. We think about a holistic approach to wellness and we think about functional and diagnostic assessments uh, and, and try to expose our nutrition students to every type of functional and uh, diagnostic assessment available. Not only so that you have uh, objective data that you can be tracking, which of course is the goal with labs, but so that when you're sitting in front of a patient, you have seen what they're showing you. It was sitting in front of a client, excuse me. You have seen what they're showing you before. It's not the first time you've seen a cholesterol lab. You've had experience uh, reviewing cholesterol labs, talking about them, what they mean, and then um, uh, have, have a, a logical path to objective uh, review over time. How often should we follow up? Uh, and what can we expect from the nutritional principles we're applying? We think about uh, that there's a person-based approach. So this, this individualized care comes into play when you're thinking about lab work, because of course, you're probably going to see a lot of functional assessments. And functional assessments enable you to provide a, a deeper level of care and so if you're able to read them, 
It will only support your practice and, and the general health and well-being of your of your clients. And then finally, a path to, to healing. So throughout the course, we're working on building your treatment notebook so that when you're in front of patients, in front of clients, excuse me, you're ready. You're ready to work. You don't have to spend time thinking about what you're seeing. You have seen it before. You've taken some notes. You pull up your notes and you're ready to go. So if you're interested in uh, improving your, uh, you know, building upon the current practice that you have through uh, taking this course, please join us for these seven weeks. It's going to be starting soon. That's my, my little pitch. I love that course. Okay, a little bit about me. Um, I, I think I'm uniquely qualified to give this session because I, uh, I uh, have a background in athletics. I played university basketball uh, where I was very lean. And following that, I... So I, I succumbed to the, I had succumbed to the um, typical thing that happens to athletes when they become real adults is they gain a lot of weight. <laughs> so I gained a lot of weight after my athletic career. And uh, since doing that, I've had success taking it off. And so now I've got some personal experience with reviewing uh, lab work with respect to uh, weight loss on, on an individual level. But also my wife and I, my wife's a, holist a holistic nutritionist, and we've had an online weight loss program uh, for over 10 years where we support uh, women across the globe on their weight loss journeys. In my clinical practice, I've got a metabolism focus. And so I've been thinking a lot about metabolic rates and how to boost them for many, many years. And I've had lots and lots of success with my, with my patients here. So that's a little more about me. Uh, this is what we do in practice uh, in my office. We test metabolism. We test resting metabolic rate and active metabolism. So what you're seeing there is a person lying on a table having the resting metabolic rate tested through the Pinoe metabolic analysis device. So we're actually determining how many calories a person built, uh, burns at rest and whether they're mostly coming from fats or carbs using this machine. Um, that's part of today's session, but the rest of the session is about lab work and other objective assessments that can be valuable in holistic weight loss and and when we're thinking about weight loss, I think it's really important to be considering that um, it, it, you have to have the energy balance model as a foundation. You have to know how to program a nutrition plan to suit the calorie deficit you'd want the person to go through. And then, of course, you have to support them um, through all the challenges that come when you are programming a deficit, like cravings, for example, fatigue, difficulty sleeping, these type of things. But, you know... Sometimes that deficit doesn't work. And very often our, our clients are telling the truth about how much they're eating. And uh, I, I am never surprised because I run so many labs. I've seen so, this is why I'm so passionate about tonight's sessions. I've seen so many circumstances where it totally makes sense why the deficit wasn't working. And when you apply the holistic approach that you know well, and uh, we'll, we'll cover the objective reporting of that holistic approach tonight. But uh, when, when you cover it well, you support them so, so, so well, and they're very grateful for your help. And, and of course, now they lose uh, their weight and the deficit starts to work and they start to feel like, OK, you know what? This is totally worth it. I know what I'm doing and I'm going to reach my goals. So let's review some of the things that come into play with respect to to that holistic approach. So we'll be thinking about this whole session. Um, I, I would like you to think about this whole session um, using a, a case-based approach. So think of one of your clients who's had a difficult time losing weight um, and what the weight they did lose, maybe they're having a really difficult time keeping it off. Keep them front and center in your mind as we go through and think about how you might be able to better support them because of them, some of the things we're going to, to talk about this evening. Um, you know, they've probably tried a series of different deficits like low carb deficit, fat, uh, low fat deficit, or maybe even a, a vegan diet where they're going low protein. Um, they may have been tracking calories and just been in a serious calorie deficit. And it's just been really, really hard for them. Try to keep someone, uh, someone like that in mind as we go through. So what do we do when we're first uh, uh, meeting with someone who's having difficulty losing weight? Well, we need uh, our, our baseline measurements. So there's a few things that are really helpful. Uh, I think obviously weighing the person getting their body mass index um, and taking some measurements. So determining relative fat max, a relative fat mass. It's a calculation that you see there on the left. Um, waist to hip ratio. And if you have the luxury of, of using a bioimpedance device, using a bioimpedance device. That's what we have in the office here. We've got an in-body uh, 570 and it tells us um, body fat percentage, body fat expresses pounds, muscle mass expresses pounds, water mass, um, visceral fat levels, and the distribution of muscle mass throughout the body. And so we're better able to say, okay, 
you haven't had success because it's very obvious that your muscle mass is far too low and that's making your metabolic rate impossible to eat under. Um, it's impossible to create a deficit because you don't have enough muscle mass. Um, so uh, it's also able to accurately track changes. Bioimpedance tells you if if someone loses, whether or not that, that loss is from water loss. And if they gain, whether or not that, lo- that gain is from water gain. Um, and when you apply a protocol to someone who needs to gain muscle, you're able to say, okay, you know what? Your weight hasn't changed, but you have put on muscle and you have lost body fat and therefore your body composition is better and more conducive to a healthy long life. And so uh, I, I think bioimpedance, high-end bioimpedance machines change everything for a weight loss practice. They have for us, we're very proud to have one. Um, but you don't really need one. You can use waist to hip ratio and you can shoot for these goals I put up there on the left. Those are really good goals to have. Um, and then for relative fat mass, if you, if, you don't, if you can't have body fat percentage, you can use these goals, a 20 for men and a 30 for women. Those are good goals for relative fat mass. This is all about programming and tracking. Um, with respect to tracking, I think an, an appropriate way to track these measurements is every 30 days. Now, a lot of that will depend on the accountability plan you want to build into your practice. Some practices really like an accountability plan of every two weeks. Um, it depends on your fee structure and how you can, um, how much you can give yourself to your clients. So for example, some people like to say, let's do a 15 minute visit every week or every two weeks. Here's the cost. It's the same cost as coming back every month, but we get more accountability out of it because you get to come in. And now with telemedicine, it's a lot easier. We've got some people who really want to check in every single week. And I love that. So think about how you might be, how you might be tracking. This is the device that we have. No, that's the 270. We have the 570, but, but I think that the, the most important thing that people are missing when they're programming nutrition for weight loss is that, that they're missing uh, the maintenance of muscle mass and the building of muscle mass for those who have low levels. When you have low levels of muscle mass, it's literally, it little, like literally impossible to keep the weight off once you lose it. Um, so the maintenance of muscle mass and if needed, the building of muscle mass should be a foundational principle when you're programming nutrition for people to having difficulty losing weight. And you see that in this periodization protocols, right? Spend three months building muscle and then create the deficit. And then the deficit works like crazy because you spent all this time improving your metabolism by having more metabolically active tissue. And if the muscle mass is already okay, the device will say, okay, your muscle mass is already fine. It's at the top of the normal limit. We can create a deficit, but when we create a deficit, we want to make sure that that deficit is not translating into muscle loss. Now I used to do a lot of intermittent fasting in the practice and a lot of, a lot of prolonged low calorie diets, to be honest, because my understanding from the literature review was that uh, it was difficult to lose muscle, but you know what? It's not difficult to lose muscle. It doesn't take two weeks to lose muscle. Now that I have this device, we can see muscle mass go down in a couple of days. I'm serious. Um, be careful with extreme low calorie diets and prolonged fasting, make sure the protein requirements are met for these, for these clients. And, um, when you are programming a deficit, check in with their muscle mass. It can be through measurements if you like, or through even strength assessments, but make sure you don't cause someone to go through a period of muscle loss um, because then once they, they might reach their goal, the deficit might still be successful, but when they do reach the goal, they are not going to be able to keep that weight off following a regular diet. They're going to gain it right back. Look at all of the significant deficit programs that are out there. You know, these programs that are five to 800 calories a day, uh, they pay uh, clients, they lose a lot of weight in the first month, but as soon as the program is done, they gain it back. So the way to prevent that is by having adequate muscle mass. Here's a small trial just to get into some of the literature. This is a trial where they did a really cool thing. They took 40 uh, premenopausal women and they put 10 on a resistance plan, training plan. They put 10 on a diet plan, 10 on a resistance training plus a diet, and 10 were just a control. And they followed them for a long period of time. And what they found was that uh, the, there was reductions in, in fat mass by all the intervention groups, not the control. They didn't lose any weight. But, but the training group, the diet group, and the training plus diet group, they all lost weight. The people who were doing uh, the training only, they were the only ones to gain muscle. And the people who did the training plus the diet, they lost the most fat. And so what you see here is that, you know, the typical protocol for people who are body composition pros is they, they lift, they do a lot of resistance training, and they try to eat in a deficit when they need to. Um, 
And that really works and it gives the best result. So um, the, the, the real key here, I would say from this study is that when you, when you lift weights and eat in a deficit, you can maintain your muscle mass and lose fat at the same time. And then when you go back to eating um, uh, uh, not in a deficit, you won't gain significantly. Okay, so the most important lab you'll see come across your desk when someone is having difficulty losing weight is a thyroid assessment. And you'll see that in the form of a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, this is the signal that the brain sends to the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. It's regulated by a feedback loop from thyroid hormone to brain that says, if there's enough, reduce the number. If there's not enough, increase the number. So the range in Canada is, is from decimal three to 5.0. And, you know, most people in complementary and integrative medicine like to have their clients below 3.0. So between decimal three and 3.0, we think that might support weight loss more efficiently than those numbers three and above. But what we know from the pounds loss trial is that the actual thyroid hormones, the free T3 and the free T4, when those are at the top of the range, uh, clients are able to lose weight much easier. And so sometimes it's worth it to do these extra assessments to see what's in free circulation at the time of this TSH score. And that might better guide um, uh, your, um, your thyroid assessment uh, when working with people having difficulty losing weight. But overall, usually the TSH reflects those numbers quite well. A, a number less than three is usually very reflective of normal T4 and T3 levels. Um, when the thyroid is having, uh, when the TSH is above 5.0, I really like to look at nutrients that are required to make thyroid hormone. And that, and that would be things like iodine, selenium, zinc. And then we like to look at things that might cause inflammation of the thyroid, uh, of the thyroid, like bromine and cadmium. And those are typically a part of a functional assessment for thyroid that you might see come across your desk as well. So this is, I call this the rule out. Because if someone has eaten in a deficit and not lost weight, they might have hypothyroidism. So you need to see the TSH come across. Throughout today's session, I'm going to share my own personal lab work just so you can see what it looks like uh, in, a, in a common um, form. This is a British Columbia Life Labs, but the, the Ontario Life Labs reports in a very similar way. See right in the page there where it says thyroid function TSH. Mine is 0.76, which is normal. It's between the ranges of 0.32 to 5.04. So that's what it looks like on an actual lab from an actual person, TSH right there in the middle. I hope seeing it live like this helps your clinical practice so, so that this is what we like to do in our lab diagnostics course is like, let's actually look at the pages so that when you see it, you're not like, okay, wait, let me orient myself to the page. No, you're already there. You've already seen it live. Next up is sex hormone uh, laboratory assessment. So you probably know people who think that their difficulty losing weight is related to their female, female or male hormones. And you know what? It very, it very well might be. Think about all those clients you worked with who just hit menopause and gained 15 pounds. Now, it, it's, like, it's extremely common. So as part of the holistic approach, I think it's very reasonable to be thinking about hormones in weight loss. Um, part of the reason is... Uh, we know that DHEA, testosterone, and estrogen are all very valuable for insulin sensitization. So insulin is the hormone that goes up when you eat carbohydrates and it pushes carbs into the cells to use as fuel. And if you have too much insulin around, it's very difficult to lose weight. Um, and when you have low hormones, your insulin is, um, uh, you have to secrete more insulin to do the same amount of work. And it's very much anabolic, the building of tissue. And so uh, I think it's helpful to have hormones in a, in a normal state. Now, um, high levels of hormones like testosterone in polycystic ovarian syndrome also correlates pretty well with difficulty losing weight. So be cautious. So I put high androgens on there as well, because it's not just low androgens that can cause uh, difficulty losing weight. The other thing that happens with uh, low androgens is very lo much low energy uh, and low motivation. Have you seen people with very low DHEA, low testosterone? They're tired. They're sluggish. It's difficult to it's di it's difficult to get moving. So an another reason to be thinking about hormones um, in weight loss. And at the very top there, I put uh, cycle. So fluid shifts. This is why bioimpedance uh, assessments of um, bio body composition are so valuable. What is happening with the water weight? Because like you, you probably know this if you've been through this before. It's like you know if you gain a couple pounds of water 
then all of a sudden you're eating treats because um, you're thinking this program doesn't work for me. Like this program is not going to, it's, it's not going to work. But if you're doing body composition scanning, you can show the client, listen, you gain some water. That's totally normal for this time of the month for you. Um, and it's going to shift back. So look at the average over time and you'll have uh, more confidence in the actual program because when we look at the amount of calories prescribed or recommended, we know it is a deficit. Now you might see functional labs for hormones. This is the Dutch test. This is what a Dutch test looks like. So in the lab diagnostics course, we go into detail into this. And I think it's helpful because you're probably going to see blood, urine, or uh, saliva hormone assessments come across your desk. And you don't want the first time you see them to be in front of a client. So when Dutch reports their hormones, they have a series of different reference ranges. They've got pre and post menopausal reference ranges and male and female reference ranges. Um, so it's important to be familiar with those uh, when you're working with someone. Uh, and then they report the breakdown products of hormone metabolism, which I think is helpful as well. Here's what it looks like on a, on a blood test for a male. Uh, this is for me um, looking at blood testing in British Columbia for uh, androgens. You see DHEA expresses DHEA sulfate. Then you see testosterone. And then free T, bioavailable T, and sex hormone binding globulin. All of those are listed when someone has had a full testosterone workup. So this is something you might see, and this is kind of uh, this is how the results are presented. And there may be different reference ranges depending on the age of the client you're working with. So something to, to keep in mind: you don't need to memorize reference ranges for each uh, for each lab because they can be different depending on the age of the client that you're working with. And that's something we go, like a lot of people who take my course, they want to know optimals for every age and reference ranges for every age. Those, the, the reference ranges are presented by the lab and then it's us to determine what's optional, uh, optimal for the person in front of us. And so we, we try to support people um, individually. Okay, so we're thinking about our we're thinking about our client that we're working with. They've had so much trouble losing. They've been in a deficit for a long period of time. Nothing's working. We checked their thyroid. We saw that the TSH was normal. Maybe they even had a T4 and a T3 test. And you know what? The T4 and the T3, they're at the top of the range. Then they had a hormone panel and they found out that for, for their age in, in this whatever part of the cycle they're being tested, the hormones are all within normal range. Um, so nothing really to work on there, but they also mentioned they don't sleep well. They're working 18 hours a day and they're drinking a lot of caffeine late into the day. Some other labs you might see, you might see cortisol, you might see stress hormone cortisol. And this is really important because we know that stress impacts weight loss. For some people, high levels of stress in the form of cortisol and adrenaline secretion, um, correlate, uh, cause weight loss because of lack of eating. But for many people, these, this hormone cascade causes weight gain. Uh, and this might be because of, uh, the overcomes consumption of food from, um, from stress eating, but it also could be from, uh, the continuous carbohydrate metabolism, uh, or mobile, sorry, continuous carbohydrate mobilization. So the, 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 the distribution of stored carbohydrate into the bloodstream to use as fuel instead of fat to use as fuel in a deficit. And then uh, continuous fat cell maturation. So when cortisol is high all the time, fat cells um, mature more rapidly. And then, of course, there's the overeating component and the lack of sleep component. So to orient into the page here, what we see on the left is a normal cycling cortisol level. In the morning, the red bar goes up, and then during the course of the day, it goes down, 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 down until it's nice and low while you sleep, and then it goes up again when it's time to wake up for the day. Now, on the right, you see someone who's extremely stressed, and they've got uh, a sort of like a flat line of cortisol uh, value, and this could be from chronic, uh, from chronic stress. They're not in a state of burnout because they have lots and lots of cortisol produced, um, it's sort of like not, it's not at the bottom of the graph there. It's in, in the middle upper part of the graph, but it's flat. It never gets low. So in order to lose weight uh, in a healthy way, it needs to go very low and you need to sleep very deeply. 
on the Dutch test, this is what it looks like. To the, the top right, you'll see metabolized cortisol. And the top right star where it says 6,500, that's the top of the range. What you're seeing here is this person has made and metabolized a ton of stress hormone over 24 hours. So, 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 so much. And then what you're seeing on the bottom graphs is cortisone and cortisol, the amount that's actually in, the cir in free circulation, which is only about 3%. But what you can see is these values are basically flatlined. So this person's cells are being exposed to a ton of cortisol all the time, and the body's having to metabolize it very, very quickly. So they're making enough, but they're not getting nice big swings all the way up and all the way down in free circulation. They're having a sort of a continuous amount in free circulation, and they're making way too much. And um, they're having a very difficult time losing weight. So stress hormone testing, I think, is really helpful. But now you've seen um, cortisol levels on a Dutch test. You could also see these in the form of a, a morning cortisol test from your local lab and an afternoon cortisol test from your local lab. And basically, the afternoon level should be half as much as the morning level. Stress and weight loss uh, is really important to know about. Okay, what about carbohydrate? You're probably all recommending low-carb diets for your clients looking to lose weight. But in order to do that, I think it's really, you know, it's really helpful to know the insulin level and how the blood sugar swings over time. Um, what you're seeing there on the screen is a continuous blood sugar monitor, which is like the coolest thing. It's a device that you wear as a patch on the arm, you stick it on, and then your, your, your phone, when you wave it over, tells you how much the blood sugar is. And this is like revolutionary in terms of nutrition prescribing because you can prescribe uh, resistant starches like you can super starch. You can prescribe, um, you know, high fiber diets, low carb diets. You can prescribe, you can put people through keto, a healthy version of keto if you'd like. And you can see a flat line of, uh, of, of glucose and you can interpret a low insulin level um, from that because uh, insulin is, of course, released from the pancreas when your glucose goes up. So this device is amazing and uh, it, 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 it really teaches the clients how to eat in a way that might be very supportive of um, of weight loss. Not that I think everyone who needs to lose weight should be on a low carb diet at all, but a lot of people, a lot of people should be, and this helps them learn. What we do typically is it stays on for two weeks. In the first week, we sort of learn how the blood sugar swings with the different meals that we're consuming. And we say, what did you learn from this meal and that meal? And how can we make it different? Can we add a little more protein here? Can we add a little more fiber here? Can we reduce the carb or even just switch to uh, whole grains or just spend 30 minutes and teach about the glycemic index? And then in the second week, what you do is you can watch how much they learned and how they're able to apply it so easily. Have an apple instead of this candy, you know, and, and, and you see major changes in week number two. Uh, and, you know, this data driven model of nutrition um, optimization is is the future. Trust me on that. Now, what do we do? So if we're looking to assess whether someone is insulin resistant or not, so when someone's insulin resistant, it means that for the amount of carbohydrate in the bloodstream, they might be secreting like way more insulin than, than a person who's not insulin resistant. And insulin is an anabolic hormone. It makes tissues grow and it makes losing tissue in the form of weight loss very, very difficult. What, what most people like to do in integrative complementary and alternative medicine is uh, we like to assess fasting blood sugar and fasting insulin and plug them into this calculator. And then you can get a, a, value, uh, a value reported that is called the hemostatic model of insulin resistance. Hemostatic model assessment of insulin resistance, HOMA IR. And it's really cool because when the value is above 2.9, you know the person's insulin resistant and not only do they need to eat low carb, but they need to put on some muscle. Uh, they need, and maybe they need to slow the gastric empty. And um, that will be incredibly valuable, not only for weight loss, but for, for overall wellness. So less damage to the blood vessels, for example, um, and less inflammation throughout. And so I, I really like to do this. And, and so how will it look when it comes across your desk? When it comes across your desk, it's going to look like this. Okay, no, wait, uh, I'll go back to that one. It's going to look like this. See at the top there where it says insulin fasting. Now, the typical, typically labs will report it as 
you know, insulin levels are very considerably and must be interpreted in relation to the serum glucose. Well, the fasting glucose is always reported at the exact same time as fasting insulin, but there's still some swing in insulin. Um, even if it's the same number of hours of fasting, it's not going to be the same every time you test it. It's very difficult test to do, but you know what, for our purposes, it is close enough to get the point across and to teach that being insulin sensitive is incredibly important. This test is good enough. And you'll see lots of primary care providers running this test. Now it's very common. It's very common, of course, in naturopathic practice, but we see a lot of conventional pro pro providers running this test as well. So what do you do? So you take the insulin fasting, mine was 35, and the glucose fasting, and mine was 4.9, and you plug it into this calculator, and I scored a 1.1. And a 1.1 is okay. Uh, anything above, uh, between 1 and 1.9 is sort of that middle normal ground. Below 1.0 is optimal. So I'm happy with my score of 1.1, but... Um, I, I could be a little bit better, but anyways, anything less, anything greater than, than 1.9 we're working on. And we have the pleasure of testing muscle mass in the office. Uh, you can do it. If you buy some calipers too, you can assess, um, someone's body fat percentage and interpret their muscle mass from them, but you can also just take simple measurements. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, combining this with a muscle mass assessment changes the game. And then what you see there on the top is the other marker of blood sugar control, which is hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is the average glucose over three months. And that really allows you to reflect upon the, how, how closely a client followed the, the nutrition programming you gave them and uh, whether or not it's working. So mine is 4.8 and you'll see there the reference range is 4.5 to 5.9. Hemoglobin A1C, really, really important to be tracking every three months in someone who uh, has insulin resistance or has progressed all the way to type 2 diabetes or even just someone trying to lose weight. If you think a low carb diet might va be valuable for them, you want to see that A1C going down over time. That really reflects that they're following the, the low carb diet that you recommended. All right. So the next lab, the next lab we might do. So we talked about stress hormone release. We talked about blood sugar control. What about actual uh, resting metabolic rate? I showed you that picture initially where we looked at the person who was lying on the table and they were breathing into, into my metabolic um, metabolism assessment device. Well, this is the kind of data that you get from this device. It tells you the mean energy expenditure on the, over there on the right, mean EE. And that is, allows you to determine the actual resting metabolic rate. And so clinics like mine are able to determine resting metabolic rate, um, but you're able to assess it through prediction, which is basal metabolic rate, and then build your nutrition protocols using that number and your perceived, your perceived activities of daily living. So when someone does a, a resting metabolic rate test, the results look like this, and typically they get a printout that says your resting metabolic rate is, and um, you can go from there. Now on an active metabolism test, this is an example of a graph for someone doing an active metabolism test. This means that they spent three minutes going at a heart rate below 100, and then every minute for 10 minutes, the exercise became more difficult. This test tells you when you're burning fat the most efficiently and, 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 and when the exercise becomes a workout for you and when you're in your sprint. When you're burning fat the most efficiently is at slow speeds. That's the yellow you see on the graph. Typically, when people are moving at slow speeds, when something is not a workout, they're burning fat. The benefit of using a, a, a respiratory analysis device for this is it also tells you how many calories you're burning. So we know, okay, you're burning exclusively fat at this time, and they're all coming from, you're, you're, you're exclu and you're burning this many calories per minute. And so we can say, if you walk at this pace for 60 minutes, you will burn this many calories. And then we can accurately uh, recommend uh, exercise for weight loss. And that plus dietary programming changes the game for most people because now they know for sure I'm in a deficit, for sure. And then results are reported, the device I have uh, reports results for metabolic efficiency, aerobic health, long heart scores, mitochondrial health, fat burning efficiency, and muscle, uh, muscle type which is really, really cool. Uh, it's called the Pinoe metabolic device, P-N-O-E, metabolism assessment device. 
Um, and we use that, we use that one for resting metabolic rate analysis and active metabolism tests. Now, um, it also gives you training zones, uh, so you can know how to train someone who's aerobic uh, in an aerobic zone versus in an anaerobic zone. And the benefit from the graphs is that you can also say in this zone, you're burning this many of calories per minute. So we can predict total calorie burn for a workout. Um, and then they tell you how much fat, uh, when, when's your fat max, when, uh, are you burning the most fat fasted and the VO two peak refers to VO two max milliliters per minute, a milliliters of oxygen consumed per minute per kg body weight, which is the best marker of aerobic health VO two max. But what if you don't have that device? So for people in my office who don't want to do resting metabolic rate analysis, but still need a nutrition plan, this is how I like to do it. Very, very simple. You go to uh, a calculator for the Harris Benedict calc uh, equation and you plug in weight. This is mine, by the way 180 pounds, five foot 10, age is 35, male, and then it spits out the BMR, the basal metabolic rate. Then, if you know how much activity they have, you can predict total energy expenditure using this calculator. And this is really cool because now you can prescribe uh, calories in a way that is for sure, uh, well, is estimated to be in a deficit. Now, the basal metabolic rate, this is the predicted resting rate for me, 1,836 calories. I've, of course, done my resting rate many times. My resting metabolic rate actually is 2,000 calories. So if I were to use this number, I would be uh, 164 calories, 163.3 calories uh, less than what I actually am, which is not very much. It's not that big of a deal, but it is off by a little bit. Still for general practice, this would be good. So let's say you wanted someone to be in a 500 calorie daily deficit, right? Which means a pound a week weight loss. If you want to do two pounds a week, it's a thousand calorie daily deficit, which is a lot harder to do. Let's say you want to do a 500 calorie daily deficit. You plug in their information here. It'll tell you their basal metabolic rate. Then what you do is you, uh, want to make sure that they don't lose any muscle mass while they're in this 500 calorie daily deficit. So you want to program at at least decimal five grams of protein per pound of body weight, uh, all the way up to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. If you really want to get crazy with the protein, but at least decimal five grams of protein per pound of body weight. And, um, you program them at the basal metabolic rate, which for me would be 1836. And then you can predict that just walking room to room and doing their daily activities, they're probably going to burn three or 400 calories per day. Now I've got a standing desk in my office and I walk to work sometimes. So the watch typically says that, you know, I'm burning 500 calories a day. I'm at 470 and it's five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so if someone like me was to eat at that 1836, it's almost guaranteed that with no exercise, I would still be in a 500 calorie daily deficit. And so that's an easy way to use a calculator like this. Now, achieving adequate protein goals and getting them to do some resistance training, even if it's just once a week, full body workout, uh, they'll maintain their muscle mass. If they do no resistance training and the protein is too low, they will lose muscle mass for sure, eating at a, the basal metabolic rate. But this is the calculator way to get around this. And you know what? It works for 500 calorie daily deficits to program at this, at this, uh, at the basal metabolic rate. Okay, so now the, the next thing we wanna look at is, is the, the triglycerides and the lipid panel or the cholesterol in general, um, you'll see a lot come across your desk. And so it's really important to be very familiar with what this panel looks like. Here's mine, uh, you see where it says lipids and it says cholesterol, that's total cholesterol and uh, the, the value there um, and the reference range. And then LDL cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol refers to the protein LDL uh, the amount of cholesterol inside that protein um, being carried by that protein, excuse me. And then HDL cholesterol, which is known as the good one. It's a protein HDL, the amount of cholesterol carried by that protein back to the liver to be, uh, be to be recycled. And then the, the cholesterol to HDL is the risk ratio. So that's total cholesterol to HDL. That tells you if you're making enough HDL for the amount of total cholesterol you have. And then most important for, I think, weight loss assessments is the triglyceride level. Triglyceride is a free circulating uh, value for carbohydrate and, and uh, free fatty acid. And this is a, is a fuel source. Triglycerides circulating 
can be metabolized for direct use as fuel. And they uh, reflect dietary consumption of simple carbohydrate and saturated fat quite well. If someone's eating very poorly, you'll see the triglycerides go up. One very important goal that we might have in weight loss is to make sure the triglycerides are less than the HDL. I like them, th them to be half as much as the HDL, which is why I'm very happy with mine at decimal seven compared to my HDL of 1.4. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with exactly where that is. And I shoot for that with, with most, most patients, but you want to make sure the triglycerides at least are less than the HDL. If they are, if the triglycerides are less than the HDL, I think it reflects that number one, the person is following the meal plan you're prescribing. And number two, they're exercising because exercise boosts HDL quite well. So keep those two things in mind. And, and, and when you see this come across your desk, look at the triglycerides. And even if it's in the normal range, if it's too high compared to the HDL, there's some dietary change that could provide a positive influence here. Now, what else? You know, a holistic approach would not be complete if we did not look at inflammation in weight loss, uh, B vitamin deficiencies, vitamin D deficiency, and hours slept per night and iron deficiency. If someone is too tired and too inflamed, they won't eat well, they won't exercise. Um, they, in fact, will likely overeat because their body is sensing the need for energy. And so they'll want more calorie, more calorie, more calorie. So look at sleep, nutrient deficiency, and inflammation. And when they come across your desk, they look very similar to the labs I've shown you before. And again, note that there might be different reference ranges for different ages, um, and there might be optimal levels for uh, certain clients that you're working with, and you want to be try to become familiar with those. So how did your client do? Last time we checked in, they were very, very stressed. Um, here's what we found out about them. Their cortisol was flat. Their blood sugar control was very, very poor. Um, and uh, they needed to sleep better and they needed to um, maybe eat less carbohydrates and do some weightlifting. And this probably provided them uh, and they, they needed to make sure that their calorie content was, uh, was appropriate. So calorie maintenance, pro minimum protein requirements, strength training and sleeping through the night. That's what they needed and they did extremely well. And now they're back to uh, losing well again. And the example I typically give when I talk about uh, that case is uh, my wife. She is a holistic nutritionist and, and she really got passionate about this when she realized that the deficit she was creating for herself wasn't working because she was uh, had too high of a cortisol level all the time and um, was in anabolic mode all the time and really needed to see swings in cortisol, uh, get the circadian rhythm back on track and, um, and uh, get really, really deep sleeps. And then all of a sudden uh, the deficit began working again. So that's, that's the kind of example that I like to, to think about. So here's a holistic approach. Use this framework to avoid the basic calorie restriction model. Still apply the energy balance approach. Still think about, okay, what's the maximum number of calories this person should be consuming to still be in a, a, the deficit that you want to create? Maybe you only want to create a half a pound per week weight loss. Maybe you only do 250 calories a day. Or maybe you only want to lose, uh, be in a deficit on the days when they're exercising. Whatever. You can create it. You can do the math however you like. But don't forget about this holistic approach because I do think it is important. If anything, it makes actually following the energy balance model easier. If you have enough energy, if your hormones are okay, if your mood is right, um, it makes it easier. The, the, um, but in order to do that, you need to see some labs and you need to be familiar with them. So uh, that is my, my session for today. I'm really grateful that you, all, that you all tuned in. I'm available for questions for the next 15 minutes. Um, again, I've got this course coming up, Laboratory Di Diagnostics in Clinical Practice. We're going to be doing this kind of deep dive into all um, conditions that you might see in clinical practice so that when you're working with someone with um, uh, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, you're going to know all about cholesterol uh, review. When you see someone with um, autoimmune disease, uh, you know, you've seen these antibodies before. You know what they look like. You know how to assess inflammation uh, mm -hmm. on the lab work. You're very familiar with them. And then you also have some idea about uh, functional tests that could be uh, either implemented or when you see them, you know how to support the person nutritionally. 
to optimize the levels that are coming back on the functional assessments. This is a little bit more about me. If you have questions, I'm, I'm always open to email communication and phone calls and everything. Uh, you can even connect with me on social media if you want to uh, ask me any questions, okay? Uh, thanks for watching.